I should say we're very pleased to be here in Munich um, and to this particular conference. Um, the light show is a bit that uh, we've had a compromise between uh, us being able to be filmed and you being able to see the, um, our presentation, but it all looks all right. So, so can I press here? Yeah. OK, we're from the Design Against Crime Solutions Centre at the University of Salford. And what we're going to be doing today um, is giving a presentation. Um, this is based on some work that be, we've been doing with our colleague, M Melissa Marcel. We've divided the presentation into two parts. Um, so we're going to start by giving a bit of background to the type of work that we do, which is Design Against Crime. And then the second part is going to be focusing on the particular project uh, which is called Youth Design Against Crime. <clears throat> so, first of all, I'll just give you a quick overview as to uh, what Design Against Crime is, uh, and uh, we'll talk a bit about where it came from. <coughs> um, we're looking at trying to take a design approach to problems of crime prevention and community safety. So, we're looking at uh, drawing on systems thinking and actually trying to take a human centered uh, approach to uh, problems. So, in terms of human centered design, what we mean is focusing on the human participants in any, in any system. But beyond physical uh, characteristics, looking at roles, uh, informal and formal, so social roles, personal roles, uh, and that means trying to understand behaviours, goals, motivations, aspirations, uh, and trying to consider both the physical and the social context. So there's a lot of work in environmental crime prevention, which is primarily uh, physical in terms of its solutions, but we are coming from the design point of view, so we're very much taking a humanistic point of view uh, and using uh, this sort of approach to try and address these problems. Um, so uh, what we're trying to do is to look at developing creative solutions to problems but without reducing the value of the particular design, be it a building or a product or whatever, to its legitimate users. Uh, so without causing frustration for people who are legitimately going about their everyday life. Uh, without increasing fear of crime, which sometimes crime solutions can make the place look a lot more scary than it was to begin with. Um, and without actually causing social problems, so segregating groups or causing a sort of a divisive approach. Uh, and finally, without causing things to actually be worse than they were in the first place, which can be a, an inadvertent uh, outcome of these sort of things. So trying to use design thinking to generate solutions that are tailored to the needs of the various people that are involved, the stakeholders, and also very much to the context that's involved. And we've applied that to all sorts of design. So it's not just the design of the built environment that we're talking about. Um, it's also the design of products, of services, of communications. So if we look here, it could be the design of that chair. It could be the design of your bag. Um, it's applied to any designed object. We've done a lot of different case studies looking at um, normal designs and the way in which crime issues have been considered. And what we tend to do is that we see that as part of um, socially responsible design. So that is where design is used to address social um, issues. And like other people, we've also got a flower. And so that's looking at the way in which design can improve education, <coughs> improve health, social in inclusion, etc. And obviously, in some cases, then these issues are very much going together with crime. So, for instance, you might be addressing crime and you might also be looking to improve well-being. In terms of its history, um, then Design Against Crime was a program that was launched in the UK. And it was something that involved the Design Council that uh, represents um, designers and involved the Home Office. And what they were looking to do is to encourage designers to actually consider crime issues in their normal design processes. Um, first of all, we got involved with a <coughs> publication which is called Think Thief. Um, some people may be aware of Paul Ekblom. This is a term that he very much uses and is quite popular in the UK. And those were guidelines then to explain to designers how they can consider crime issues. And then more recently, then we've um, been involved in developing another set of guidelines with the Design Council, which is called Design Out Crime. 
And so what we tend to do is we tend to develop things like models and guides that can be used often by professional designers in the UK. So um, one of the things we did was we took the, we came up with the crime life cycle, which is a, a way to try and enable designers to think around the problem of crime in a more, a more fully. Uh, and it draws on the work by Ekblom on his uh, criminal uh, conjunction of criminal opportunities, which I think has about 22 different factors. What we've done is tried to bring that down to look at the six pre-crime causal factors that will build towards a crime occurring, uh, any one of which you can intervene in, in a design, uh, a designer could look at intervening in, and then also to look at the four post-crime issues that can, that can occur and how this then becomes a cycle <coughs> that creates more crime if it's left to uh, keep going. So the aim was to try and give tools to designers to enable them to still be creative but actually to be effective, to have it based on some sort of theoretical uh, basis. Um, as well as uh, doing the work for the Design Council, we, we worked quite a lot with the police in the UK. Uh, we first started working uh, with the GMP back when Design Against Crime first began. And in 2003, we established with Greater Manchester Police uh, the Solution Centre, the Design Against Crime Solution Centre. And that was working primarily with architectural liaison officers who are a uh, type of police officer in the UK that gives advice to architects, planners, uh, developers. Um, and uh, Mike Hodge, who was at the time heading the architectural liaison unit at Greater Manchester Police, was interested in being more effective and becoming more involved in the design process rather than just the uh, bureaucratic planning process. Uh, and so we did an evaluation with them to look at how they deliver their service, uh, which involved looking at exactly how what they did, but also talking to the people that they work with, the planners and the architects. <coughs> and out of this actually came a complete rebrand of the service. So they dropped architectural liaison officer, which has got a quite militaristic sound, and they're now designed for security consultants. So if you go to designforsecurity.org, that is now part of the police, but they've positioned themselves to be more in tune with their clients who are generally architects and planners. Uh, we then took this and looked at all of the 43 forces in the UK and looked at how they were all delivering crime prevention in different ways uh, and did some work with uh, the Association of Chief Police Officers to come up with a, a plan for a national service, which uh, unfortunately it's still a report at the moment, I think, current financial situation. Um, but uh, this is all available on their website. We've also done um, a lot of work in uh, Europe through funding through European Commission <coughs> programmes such as Hippocrates and Aegis. And uh, we've worked with uh, European partners such as the DSP Group. And um, Paul van Sumeren is the chair of the European Designing Out Crime Association. And of course we're involved in um, planning urban security, so we're very pleased that our colleagues are here with us today. Uh, with the Landis Criminal Amt in uh, Lower Saxony. And that involves them working um, with partners in Austria, Germany and Poland and the UK. And so what we have then is that we are able to apply some of our work to different contexts. Um, it means that we've been able to develop some of our guidelines into German, for instance. So the, one of the earlier versions of the crime lifecycle model has actually been translated into German. What we've also been doing is a lot of work which looks at um, the different contexts, so the way in which best practice might have to be adapted um, to suit different local contexts but also different national contexts. And for that we've been doing work such as the Design Against Crime Exchange Tool and um, we're also going to be having forthcoming work um, in the form of the maturity model that comes out of the planning urban security work and there will be um, a seminar that will be held at the end of May for that. So, in terms of Youth Design Against Crime, um, this project arose from some work that we did in the centre of Manchester. We had a project called City Centre Crime uh, that was actually funded partly through the Crime and Disorder Reduction Partnership, which are a community safety partnership involving the council and all the different authorities in the centre of Manchester. And they had a problem in this area 
identified in the in the map. Um, it's very central for those who don't know Manchester. It's sort of bang in the middle of what most people would call Manchester. Uh, and they had a problem with various hotspots. And so what we did was we looked at the way in which the area was designed, but also how it was being used and how it was being managed and all of the systems that were in play to try and come up with ideas that might reduce some of the problems that were there. And that resulted in about 20 design intervention ideas. Um, through publication of these, uh, we were contacted by the charity Catch22, who asked us whether we'd actually involved young people in any of this work in terms of coming up with the solutions, which we hadn't done. Uh, and so their suggestion was that we work together. Uh, and what that ended up being, that work ended up being Youth Design Against Crime, this program that we developed together based on the work in City Centre Crime. And um, basically, this stems from the problem we have. Uh, which is insecurity generated by young people. So I say problem, it's in inverted commas, uh, whether, how real that problem is uh, is up for discussion. But there is a perception, a strong perception, that, that youth is a problem and a threat to society, especially when hanging out in an urban environment. There's uh, what's called outgroup homogeneity, where people who are not us are seen as being all the same. And this is something that I think uh, young people suffer from. They're all tarred with the same brush in the UK. We have the term hoodies. I don't know whether that's come over here yet, but anybody with hoodie is a problem. Uh, what's interesting is that when you talk to actual shoplifters, they're quite happy that there are all these people that are being watched who are completely innocent but with hoods <laughs> on, while they're quite happily going about their business committing crime dressed in a suit or something. Um, but it generates feelings of fear, reduces quality of life, but also um, the worrying thing is that uh, we've done work with uh, public transport in Manchester and it does impact on especially older people whether they feel they're able to use public transport if they feel it's not safe. Um, of course, there is some basis to this. Uh, there is more offending by young people, especially young males. Um, offending peaks between 11 and 24. Uh, but also it's very much linked to social issues, uh, neglect, violence, abuse. Uh, and also this sort of deprivation does lead to emotional problems such as low self-control, anger and distrust uh, that leads to criminality. Uh, and it, ultimately it damages relationships with adults. Uh, but the other side of the coin, of course, is that young people are much more likely to be victimised than other members of society. So 16 to 24-year-olds experience high levels of victimisation. Uh, over a quarter of 10 to 25-year-olds are victims of theft in the last 12 months. Uh, this is according to the Home Office statistics. And so leading on from that, the issue of offending, what might it be that's causing some of this inappropriate behaviour? And there's some uh, research that suggests that um, people try and get self-esteem through their daily interactions. When they're not able to do that, then they get an impaired sense of self-image. Because of that, then what they might try to do is try and raise their self-esteem, but in a different way. And so what you tend to get is that, in the case of young people, that when they're together with their peers, with the people that are the same age as them, then they will try and boost their self-esteem. And that can often mean acting in an aggressive or rebellious way. The difficulty is, is that they then act in a rebellious way, for instance, at school, which results in then getting a sense of self-esteem, but obviously isn't very good in terms of uh, performance at school. And they are not worried about being punished by the adults because actually the payoff is what they get from the, from the peers that are present. So, in the UK, what kind of approach do we tend to have to dealing with young people? Um, obviously, a lot of people have heard of the mosquito device, uh, where a high-pitched noise is made to try and, uh, which if you're under 18 is supposed to be very uncomfortable, and then moves young people away from a particular area. Um, another approach is what we call the Manilow method, after Barry Manilow. So this might be the Engelbert Humperdinck approach <laughs> next, but although I think if he wins, then that it might not be so appropriate. But the playing of uncool music so that young people don't want to stay there. <laughs> um, what we also have is obviously the removal of affordances. So that's the idea that um, where young people gather, then you take away the things that are making that area attractive. So you remove the seating, you take away the overhang that they may be standing under to keep out of the rain, etc. Of course, that affects legitimate users as well who might need the seats. 
That's right. Or there's other things to do with, say, skateboarding, for instance. So um, a wall or some steps that might be used for skateboarding, then they might put devices on those so that they can't be used anymore, such as these sorts of clips. And so what we tend to feel is that in the UK, certainly, they have an attitude um, to young people which is a bit like with pigeons. So th <laughs> these are the spikes that are supposed to keep pigeons out of certain areas. And I say they have certain devices that they use to keep young people away. Now, the problem is, of course, that actually this isn't just a few isolated um, instances of solutions that are used. It's actually um, a policy in the UK which is to some extent about the criminalisation of young people. Um, there's very much a focus in the UK on antisocial behaviour and on um, what we have as antisocial behaviour orders. So that's where young people or any people who have been behaving inappropriately are banned from a certain area or banned from... Um, behaving in a particular way. Now what do we mean by antisocial behaviour? When you actually look at it, um, it's behaviour likely to cause harassment, alarm or distress according to the legislation. And as you can see that is something really quite broad. Um, so they try to make it more specific. Um, but the problem is then they actually have um, a list of behaviours, things like drinking alcohol on the streets, general drunken behaviour which is rowdy or inconsiderate. Now, obviously, that's the sort of behaviour that happens quite a lot, um, but only in some cases will that um, be acted upon and action taken against it. And what we also have is that uh, while um, antisocial behaviour orders are a civil sanction, then the breach of an antisocial behaviour order is actually a criminal offence. And so um, someone would then get a criminal record and they do actually have the potential to go to prison for that. And um, what we're very much seeing in the UK is very much a concern with public perceptions and also with public um, confidence in the police. In, the, uh, in Manchester, for instance, then um, a sample of the population are actually surveyed every month so that the police can always be on track with what current thinking is about the problems in their neighbourhood and also how well the police have performed. And then those survey results are compared and obviously not just in the UK now but also we are also comparing them on a European level. In the media we've seen very much a stereotyping of young people. So there's a lot of talk about antisocial behaviour in the press. It's a very media friendly term and we've seen um, such an increase in the number of articles about that sort of issue. And the problem is, is that people tend to presume that there is this problem and they also assume or write that this is due to a breakdown of community. And of course this chimes well with people's fears about not knowing their neighbours and feeling isolated. So it builds into all sorts of uh, common perceptions about young people. But also in politics in the UK, then what we've got actually is a very much a focus on petty behaviour, um, usually in relation to young people. And um, we have things like, often we talk about certain cultures, such as youth culture or job culture. And because of that, then all young people tend to get grouped together and linked with a particular type of undesirable behaviour. And um, this actually does tend to link to policy in the sense that because of the kind of moral panic this, this creates, then governments do actually respond to that. And we saw that in relation to the UK uh, riots. Now, obviously, we do not feel that youth alienation solves any of the problems that we've referred to. And in fact, the recent report that was um, done after the UK riot suggests that it can actually be a cause of some of the problems. But before we get too complacent, of course, we have to look at our own research that we might be doing as well. Um, to what extent are we using uh, particular terms that just key into stereotypes about young people? And this is unsupervised youths in the street is actually one of the top environmental causes of unsafety, feelings of unsafety in the population. 
And this comes from the International Crime Survey, the one that's done particularly in, in Europe. And um, I thought this was quite interesting because obviously the ter in English the term youth does conjure up a different image to young person. Um, but also the idea that they are unsupervised and that's a problem because actually we're probably talking about young people who are 12 to 18 years old. So are we actually saying that sh they should always, um, always be on the line? <laughs> <laughs> So what we felt was that um, that design offers a better solution to that, or we'd hope it offers a better solution. And what design tends to do is try and understand some of the needs or some of the requirements of young people and develop designs that meet those needs. What they also have been very much involved in is trying to involve young people in design planning and community safety, and also um, improving skills. And I know in Germany a lot of work has been done um, in relation to this. There was a very impressive seminar that was run um, in Berlin um, in collaboration with Plan Spy, and that actually got young people to chair half of the seminar. And that was very interesting to see because there were politicians there who were used to giving their pat answers to questions. Uh, but when young people were there, they asked in a very polite and friendly way, but in a challenging and interesting way. And it certainly did challenge your attitudes in relation to young people and show what a difference they could make. Um, also in the Netherlands, then uh, there's a program called Kids in Space where they actually try and get young people involved in the planning process. So, get back to Youth Design Against Crime. As I said, we did this work in the centre of Manchester. Uh, and what this enabled us to do was to develop a method for coming up with these design ideas. Um, and then what we were able to do was to use that method and transfer it into a program uh, or a process for the young people to uh, work with. So we developed a 12-week uh, process. It's normally 10 or 12 weeks we run this for. Uh, and this becomes the Youth Design Against Crime program. So it starts off with a launch event where we get the young people who are working on the project together. We do team building exercises with them, uh, get them to know each other because often they're from different schools. Um, these are all children who have been excluded from school, so they're not in normal, what we'd say in the UK is normal curriculum. So these are children who uh, have been excluded uh, and therefore are on an alternative curriculum. Uh, we bring them all together and then we introduce them to the challenge, which is the process that we have outlined in a workbook that they complete, uh, which shows the four stages of the Youth Design Against Crime project, which is scanning and mapping, assessing the problem, developing a response, and then reviewing and refining it. The whole 12 weeks then ends with a showcase evening. And that showcase evening we model on X Factor which uh, I'm sure you can't, can't fail to be aware of X Factor these days. Uh, but the idea is that it's a, an event held at a public venue, like a theatre. Uh, we do it, we invite all family and friends along of the participants. It's held with a live judging panel, not this judging panel obviously, but a, judge, a high profile judging panel. So we try and get senior police officers, uh, people who are involved in community safety at a senior level, uh, local councillors, planners, that sort of thing. So four or five judges. Um, and uh, they present their ideas at this event. Uh, in the middle of the, in, in the, middle of the uh, process, the programme, we have a, what we call a mid-challenge activity, which is a chance for all the groups halfway through to get together. And what we've done on previous events is we've all taken everybody bowling. So it's a, a night out or a late afternoon and early evening out uh, where everybody gets to talk to each other and we get to find, get a feel about how they're getting on with their ideas and their process. So, as I say, we have normally four teams. We had, at the last one we did, we actually had nine teams involved, and it was a complete nightmare. But we <laughs> aim for four or five teams in one project of five to seven young people between age of 11 to 19, so average about 15. Each team is supported by a youth worker, uh, and that's Catch-22 is very much involved in that. But also, importantly, each team has a police officer dedicated as a mentor who works with that team throughout the programme. Um, and they've all volunteered so far, so that we've not had any senior officers dobbing people in. We've managed to get <laughs> local neighbourhood police officers in to work with these young people. 
So in the first three weeks, they do what we call the scoping and understanding the challenge. So they set the ground rules for themselves as they're going to work. Um, they they importantly they select the focus area that they're going to work on so it's the young people's job to choose what area that they think is problematic in where they live and for example we've had uh, things from public parks to uh, subways or underpasses we've had um, walkways that are on the way to shops that people have had problems with things to do with public seating we've had a, uh, another thing we had was a bridge over a motorway we had a, a one of our recent ones so there are a variety of different types of areas, but generally public space rather than any private space. Weeks four and six, they do their scanning and mapping. So we send them out uh, to actually understand what the problem is. Clearly the police provide them what data that they can provide them with, but it's important to send them out and talk to the people who are using these areas to actually have an understanding of what's going on. Um, which often means the young people are talking to people in their community, sometimes for the first time, which can be interesting. Um, <laughs> We then get them to actually do a map as well, what we call a place-centred map. So um, this is an example we show them. This is actually Piccadilly Gardens in the centre of Manchester. But we ask them to do a rough, we use Google Maps, but you can do a rough sketch of an area. But then to look at how is it being used in the different spaces, what are people doing in those areas, and then if they've got mobile phones, which they all have, to take some photos of what's going on in those areas so they can add that into their process. Um, I say so we six to ten is then actually assessing what the problem is so actually using what we've called the problem profile which is a way of actually getting all of the data they've got and analyzing it in a very uh, structured way to understand what the problem is and its context and to then try and enable them to have a platform from which to build some ideas that are going to be grounded the next stage is to come up with their response so they develop various ideas um, that they come up with but importantly we tell them that they have to go back to the community the neighborhood and check those ideas with the people that they might have interviewed earlier on so they go back uh, having selected their favorite idea they go back and test it out and then if necessary they refine that idea uh, before they present it at the final event so week 10 and 12 they prepare their showcase presentation they develop how they're going to how they're going to present this thing we've had people presenting it as a drama people presenting it in a, a video which they made sort of a version of a, a police soap one of them with the police's help rushing around in vans and things we had people coming in completely set up dressed up as superheroes and they made a comic so quite creative ways of presenting the ideas they complete the workbook as well importantly uh, and then um, on finally they present it at the showcase evening um, what we've done as well is we we publicize in their local area the showcase evening to encourage people to come along um, this larger one on the right here was the most recent one we did which was actually held at the local football ground and then uh, buses were laid on to enable local residents to actually come along to this event um, which went very well so um, so in terms of what we've done so far, we've run five of these uh, projects to date. We've had about 200 young people through. Um, we've done two in Manchester and Salford area, one in the borough of, S of Southwark in London, which is a, a very deprived South London area, another one in Lambeth, uh, and then the last one in Bolton in Lancashire. Uh, and we've actually found that the young people have been very capable in terms of actually demonstrating some good ideas and some good problem solving. Um, the workbook, we've had that accredited by an agency called ASDAN, which means that the young people who complete the workbook will get the equivalent of an O-level or a GCSE in problem solving and team working, I think it is. But these are kids who would otherwise leave school at 15 with no qualifications at all, so it gives them something that they can have on their CV. Uh, and then finally they get to present at a high profile event which they would never at the start of this this is the thing they most think they aren't going to be able to do is actually get up and present in front of people so just a few pictures this is uh, the first one we did which was in Manchester this was actually held at a nightclub called the Birdcage which was fantastic uh, and that's a councillor on stage Jim Battle who's the head of crime and disorder in Manchester uh, addressing the crowd of family and friends this is one of the groups presenting uh, their idea uh, and they present to the judging panel. So we have the, uh, the head of the CDRP there on the left, and then we have a, a superintendent of police, and then we have a councillor. And they're asking quite tough questions of these young people, and it's always quite amazing how they can hold their own uh, when, you, when you give them a microphone. So it's quite interesting. But they've responded very well. 
This is one of the, I think this is the, the Lambeth group of young people who were involved. Uh, this is one of the groups at Southwark on stage presenting their ideas. And this is the judging panel. So again, we have planners, uh, senior police officers, all watching what they're doing and then giving them feedback and asking questions at the end. And then this is uh, the winning group from, uh, well, the winning group's at the front, but it's the whole, all the participants at the Southwark YDAC that we ran. Uh, that was actually at, a, um, at the Unicorn Theatre in London. You can see that the group on the left with all the CSI, they, the police, their police uh, mentor managed to pilfer them some overalls to use in the presentation. Okay. So in terms of the outcomes, and it should be said that the young people obviously present on stage, um, but it's not just the quality of the presentation that's important, it's actually the design idea. So whether it's a good design, whether it will address the issues that they've identified as being a problem, and whether it's based on sound um, research, and also whether they work together effectively as a team. Um, now I have to say that the young people are able to come up with very creative ideas. Um, so for instance, in relation to uh, one team, they wanted to develop um, a bridge that was um, going over one of the main roads into Salford as a gateway to Salford. Now that is the sort of an idea that an architect is likely to come up with. So often quite creative ideas. A trophy is awarded to the winning team, um, but the others also get um, awards as well. And um, what we found is that um, young people were then invited to get into further discussions with city planners and with engineers. And in all the cases where the young people presented, then people, um, the judges pl pledged funding to take forward the ideas. Now, in some cases, the ideas have actually been implemented. Um, for instance, there's um, a subway um, going under one of the main roads into Manchester, and that attracted robbery and antisocial behaviour. And um, those ideas were implemented that the team had, but it took two years for that to come about. So it's not necessarily a quick process when people say they will do something. Um, but what was nice about this was that the one of the um, organisations that actually been involved in dealing with some of the problems in relation to this area actually said that the ideas that the young people had come up with were better than the ideas that they'd had and they tore up, tore up their own plans and went with the ideas that the young people had. I think they've now got a plaque on the wall next to the subway with the young people's names. Like. <coughs> the other thing is that the ideas are sometimes considered <coughs> innovative. Um, there was a problem in that um, there was seating that was being used on the way to a local shopping precinct and it was being used by people drinking and that was generating fear. And so the police have obviously wanted to remove the seating um, but the problem was that that was being used by older people on the way to the shop so they didn't want to do that. And so um, what the young people suggested was individual seats um, but spaced apart so that you couldn't actually use it to congregate or to talk with other people. And, of course, it's such a simple idea. And the others said, why didn't we think of that? But it was actually the young people that came up with that idea. Um, one of the ones that we particularly like is because it's more creative. Um, came about by a team called Kick Out Crime. And they've been looking at some of the problems in a park and they thought that the problem was going to be antisocial behaviour, but no, the um, people that used the park were actually worried about dog fouling. Now, what we would normally think is that you would apply the standard solution, same as with pigeons, and say that you don't want any dogs in the park, therefore. But no, what they suggested is that they would create a dog paradise, and that would be funded by um, dog owners, um, so that dogs then would be um, using a particular area of the park um, and that they would have fines for those um, involved in dog fouling and it would be like a criminal record for dogs. So, oh, sorry. I was going to show you the, the Catch-22. The, the case studies are all available from Catch-22's website. Okay. okay. So... After having done the four of the projects, we actually were asked by Catch-22 to undertake an evaluation uh, to look at 
um, not just the impact on the young people, but also to look at potentially ways in which WIDAC might be improved. So we did focus groups with all the people who've been involved, the young people, youth workers and the police, and also we managed to do telephone interviews with most of the judges who had attended the events. And what we found was there was a change of attitudes amongst the adult participants. So as well as impacting on the young people, it actually equally impacted on the, young, on the adults who'd been involved. So a number of the teachers reported that they now had a better relationship with their class after having gone through the programme. But most interesting for us were that a lot of the police, who obviously have a lot of experience with ASBOs in the UK of dealing with the young people, found that they had had their attitudes altered. We had a, one police mentor particularly um, suggested that, um, that this had broken down some sort of barrier uh, and it actually was his eyes were opened about the young people's motives in being involved. And we had one uh, police officer in London who said in, they now see the group on the street and they actually now say hello to each other, whereas previously they would never have said hello to a policeman. Uh, and a counsellor uh, who was there uh, after having listened to some of the solutions, couldn't understand why they weren't doing this already in terms of getting ideas or getting the young people involved. In terms of how the young people changed, then what we found was that at the launch event, then often they lacked self-confidence and they tended to think of WIDAC as just another project, one that was aimed at young people that were excluded. And they tended to think that they wouldn't, wouldn't be able to make it to the end of the project and they also thought that they were there as a sort of punishment. They were there because they were bad. That's why they had to do WIDAC. They did find WIDAC challenging. It was a new social situation for many of the young people. They had to get to know new people, and they were often actually quite shy in that situation. They also had to work together in a team, and obviously some of the people didn't contribute as much as they would have liked, and so they had to deal with some team members not pulling their weight, and that was difficult. They also had to um, do research, and they had to consult with the community. And as I say, some of those uh, community members had quite negative attitudes towards young people, so that was quite difficult for them. And they would actually refuse to be consulted. Um, and also, of course, the idea of standing on stage and taking part in an X Factor um, event uh, was very nerve-wracking for some of the young people. And the programme was competitive, so it put them under a lot of pressure. But what we also found from the evaluation was that the young people did confirm that they did actually make the decisions. And that, for them, was very important. And also what the youth workers said was that they felt that actually being able to make the decisions, I think particularly being able to choose the area or the problem that they looked at, was very important. It meant that they got excited about the project and that they wanted to see it through to the end. And they were given a voice. They did learn to speak in public and they did feel that they were listened to and that gave them a sense um, of being able to achieve something. And for some people then, that was a definite change in feeling of confidence, and some said that that was a life-changing experience. And what we most perhaps recognised was how proud the young people were. They were proud of the fact that they won. Uh, the ones that came second were proud that they came second. But I think most important, they were proud because they actually completed the programme. And for most of them, that was an achievement in itself. We started and we finished. We actually won for completing a whole project. So, um, as Caroline mentioned earlier on, there was some tension between the community and these young people. And, and this came across when we asked them how their relationships might have been affected by their work in the project. Uh, one girl said, uh, in terms of how she was talking to, trying to get somebody's opinion from behind a door, uh, said that the, the, the person in the house, um, she thought I was a bad person when I knocked on her door. She was kind of, what are you doing? And then I explained to her, and she was talking to me like I was normal which I thought was quite sweet that she suddenly thought she was normal. Uh, so then I kind of developed a relationship. So again, some of these people were able to come along to the final events, which was quite nice to be able to see the people who were normally labelled as making the problems as coming up with some of the solutions. 
Um, in terms of the impact on actual crime in the area, obviously it's too early for us to say with a lot of the ideas, as, as Caroline mentioned earlier on, it taking a long time to get anything in the built environment from an idea into a physicality, but we're looking to track that. However, the feedback from the police has been that it's helped them address very hard to reach young people, uh, and they believe that in itself will be a, a help for them. Okay. Yeah, so in conclusion, then, um, one of the things that particularly impressed us, and particularly Andrew, because Andrew teaches at the University of Salford, so he teaches product design, etc., was how well the young people on this program could, through a program of 12 weeks, learn to design against crime. Um, but what we also found was that the success of the program depends very much on its design and its delivery. It only works if you've got motivated youth workers, police mentors, and teachers... And it's very important that the young people learn about research and they develop the skills that they need to be able to design and to be able to communicate ideas. What's also very important is that at the showcase evening, um, then you need to have judges who are genuinely interested in the issues and ideally who are involved in um, projects that are about re regeneration and perhaps also have access to um, political and to uh, financial resources. Um, what we also found was that the young people must be actively engaged. <coughs> so it's much better if they address real issues and they should actually be making decisions and they need to benefit from the programme. And that's why it was important, I think, that they actually got the qualification out of it and had a sense of having achieved something. And in our case, we found that it was good that they could uh, make a change to the neighbourhood or to the community at the very least, then they need to be listened to. Ideally, opportunities should exist for ideas to be implemented. But obviously, that is something that you can't guarantee because the ideas have to chime with what is required or wanted and also the funding does have to be available to implement ideas. But most importantly, feedback needs to be given to the young people and to the adult participants so they know what's happened as a result of the ideas that they've had. Um, we also know that the adults can be transformed by the process of, of engagement with young people, um, but that the young people have to be given the design skills to be able to do that. And the mentors and the teachers have to be willing and able to engage with the programme. In some cases, if you find that you've got teachers who don't expect that they're going to spend time on the programme, um, then it, it doesn't work. And also you've got to go to a lot of effort to actually engage the families of the young people. Um, like Andrew said, of actually bussing um, families to events, making it easy for them to attend. And also what we need to do more in our future projects is to be able to dedicate more resources so that we can actually communicate more about the efforts of the young people to their community, because I think that would help also more people change their attitudes towards young people. Um, there's been a lot of research done about the different programmes that exist and obviously our research then chimes with that. The importance of decision making, the need for young people to have leverage over adults in positions of power um, and there's a small amount of research which actually looks at the use of creativity particularly in improving relationships between young people and adults. Um, and there's a very um, detailed report, um, the Akori's uh, research programme, that looks into all the different regeneration programmes that have been involving young people, and there's a lot of interesting um, findings in that. And what we feel is particularly needed is to learn more about the intergenerational relationships. Um, young people, we think it would be interesting to bring them together with older people, because both groups are... Um, tend to be considered in a particular way in society and to be excluded. Mm. And we think it would be particularly interesting as well to have more detail about the way in which people are actually transformed through their relationships because in the research it tends to document the types of projects that have been undertaken but it's difficult to understand the dynamics of how the change takes place. And I think that's it. Good. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Andrew. I don't even have time to say a first sentence. There's a first question. <laughs> Second question. <laughs> well, first of all, congratulations for this interesting initiative. Uh, obviously, there are some elements in the whole exercise very close to future workshops or community action plans. Huh? Now, there are only two qu short questions. The first is, isn't that missing link uh, to existing public or private budgets to implement the ideas, uh, a threat to the whole thing. Uh, you pointed out that sometimes you need one, two years uh, for the implementation of the measures uh, pro uh, proposed. And by our experience from ERM upgrading in a project uh, dealing with uh, infrastructure for s similar situations in South Africa, these two years can be crucial. Uh, when it comes to the participation and the interests of the groups you involve. And the other question is, uh, is there anything foreseen to involve by chance for simple, uh, let's say, construction measures, the use in, involved in the, in the workshops, <coughs> so that you make use of their labor, for example? Whose labor? Yeah, sure, that you make use of the use for simple, um, construction works. All oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, in the, in the, implementation the first part. Project. We, uh, when we first started, the, the purpose of WIDAC is not to implement crime prevention solutions. The purpose of WIDAC, it's a youth program. So when we, when we always start these projects at the launch event, we emphasise to the young people that there is absolutely no guarantee that any of these will be taken up. But we make sure we have judges at the panel, especially the councillors who frankly always say, why aren't we doing this? Uh, and then if you also have a planner in the same room at the same time, he can only say, I don't really know, and then things happen. <laughs> so we try and engender a situation where this sort of catalyst uh, it occurs. Yeah, But I totally agree that it does take a long time for things to get developed from an idea to the uh, end point. But the main reason the young people get involved is not to do with having to have the output. Just making it to the end for most of them is a major hurdle. And, and the fact that they've done that, they've, uh, Caroline said, they're so massively proud of having just done that. Um, and when we had this one project that so far has been implemented, they came back to us thinking that the idea was ours. And we had to explain to them, no, this was a young person's idea. Because the idea, the ownership of the idea, they lost track of that during the two years that it took mm. to implement it. So we had to point them back to the school that it came from. Um, so one of the things we're looking at and one of the recommendations from our evaluation is the tracking of these ideas needs to be done more formally. The second question, uh, actually the most recent winner at the Bolton, uh, the last one we did, was um, actually by a group that said that they wanted to get involved with the clearing up. And so uh, that was taken into account. And most of the groups, for instance, when we've had a group that suggested mm -hmm developing a playground have wanted to be involved in cleaning it up or even maintaining it over a longer period. So a lot of this ownership does come from the fact that they own the idea, therefore they feel they own the solution and part of that is the management maintenance type of thing. So we do, we do put that in but like I say the main focus is not the crime solution at the end, it's actually the process that they go through. But you're right, it's quite a difficult situation to manage because, is, yeah. you know, the expectations are raised at a final event where funding is promised. And then, of course, it may be that nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And so we may longer term need to look at how do we manage that process um, more effectively that people then don't become demoralised as a result of feeling that their idea wasn't listened to. Because obviously not all ideas get taken up. No. That is how it is, yeah. Okay, Tina. Thank you. Well, my first question would have actually resonated very much with what Udo just asked um, about how you dealt with the issue of um, young people conceiving this is yet just another thing where they are being abused and it's just fake. Mm. You, know, you get them engaged mm. and they work really hard and in the end nothing comes out of it. Um, but uh, the, the other question I, I'm interested in is have you actually costed the 12-week 12 12 project and how much, you said you had some volunteers um, from the police and involved, but how much time was actually spent with the youth groups and especially how much time by the social workers? Because I could imagine that there was quite a bit of support needed for the youth groups that came from social workers. Okay. It was youth workers. That yes. no, yeah. Yes. Um, I, well, on the, I know that, that that has varied depending on 
where the funding has come from. These pro all these projects have been slunted slightly differently. The ones we did in London was actually funded by JP Morgan. They gave some money for that. The first one in Manchester was funded by the Prudential through the work they do with shopping centres. So this, a lot of this has been dealt with by Catch-22. Um, in terms of the amount of time that is, that's <coughs> given, um, it's normally a day or half a day a week in some cases. So uh, the youth worker will come in and will manage the session. Um, the police officer will also uh, have a day or half a day a week that he spends. Um, but in the UK, what we've managed to do is, because we have neighbourhood police officers, the GMP has counted some of this as almost like training, because it's getting them to meet the neighbourhood, which they otherwise would have more difficulty in doing. So uh, they've, uh, GMP have managed, I don't know how they account for it, but we don't pay their time, so I presume it's accounted in some way by the police. But it's been seen as an investment by them uh, in their time with the young people. Uh, in terms of the actual cost of a programme, I'm sorry, <coughs> but I, I don't know quite how much that is, but we could find that out for you. Okay. Okay, Philip. You said one of the major challenges is to find people who are motivated and passionate about it. How do you find them? <laughs> well, of course, they came to us. <laughs> 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 um, it was basically because of the work that we'd done uh, being in the, in the newspapers, then um, somebody came to us who was everything that you would want from a motivated person, able to inspire young people, able to get on well um, with adults and having all the connections at schools. Um, and so basically it was through him, through Norman Lloyd, um, who he was then able to get everybody involved. So that was one of the key things. And he then recruited people like the the youth workers, for instance. And so, and but they, they did dedicate a lot of time, um, particularly the initial projects, um, actually trying to set them up. And the problem is if you don't dedicate that time to making sure that the teachers, the um, youth workers, etc., all know what they're doing and are committed, then the projects don't work very well. That's the problem. I think, I think the problem we've had is not so much with the youth workers. Who, in my experience, they're all incredibly motivated. It's actually the teachers. Uh, we had a couple of schools where the teachers seemed to think that meant they had the afternoon off if the youth workers were leading the session. And uh, that was a problem because obviously that's not the case. You were also talking about councillors and urban planners being involved. Yes. They also have to be well, by the end of the event, they're, they're, they're asked to come along for an evening. So they come along at 5 and they go at about 8.30. And by the end of the event, after having seen all the presentations, they're all pretty motivated. That's what's been a, an eye-opener for me, to be honest, because you see um, they, we have a little meeting beforehand where they look at the workbooks and it's all very dry, and then they go and listen to the presentations and we, then we go back in the judging room and they select a winner, and it's completely different uh, context there. But it's the young people that are the enthusiasm. They sort of feed it in, I think. Okay, we have three more questions. Just Four more questions. Uh, <laughs> you indicated clearly this is a youth program, but you know, not semantics. But but issues like, for example, the programs are geared to youth at risk, and you put it in your comment there. You could just, but you also say things like relationships improve. When the lady thought I was, and then she spoke to me normally. Um, you know, it's designed against crime. Is it not perceived as being something for youth at risk only? In other words, youth who have the potential to be criminals. When in fact, this is a youth program that should be for young people, uh, not as youth at risk. Okay. Will, it, will it not get tainted? That's what I'm saying. And I, I mean that in, in every way that you'd like to look at it. Because, you know, back home also, you have young people in, in schools, in communities, where the schools do all kinds of things, citizenship and things, and they do things like this as part of the school program, parents pay for it. And then you've got young people who at 2 o'clock, they're out of school, they're on the streets. Not all of them are youth at risk. Many of them, parents struggle to keep them on the straight and narrow, and they do get there eventually. And many are a youth at risk. And so the complaint is, why are you always doing something for those children and I'm struggling here at home to, to keep my child on the straight and narrow and there are no programs because he's got to be a youth at risk before he gets there. And you know this is designed against crime but you emphasize it's a youth program. Maybe it's just semantics but it's, it's, it's an issue. Yes, I mean I think, um, I mean ours obviously came about just by chance in the sense that um, the group of young people that we've been involved with came about because of being contacted from the charity Catch-22. 
Um, the, some of the work that we've done in the past has been looking at um, putting Design Against Crime into the curriculum for uh, pupils at schools. So we have been involved with that. I mean, I think you're quite right that um, youth Design Against Crime could be used for all groups of youth or young people. Um, but a lot of programmes are actually about that. They are about engaging young people in design, engaging young people in planning. And actually, I think we're more unusual in actually targeting um, young people at risk of offending. And obviously, I think the insight that they bring to some of the problems and the fact that they are normally seen as the cause of some of the problems does make the fact that we target, target this group quite interesting and quite exciting, I think. So, I mean, we'd be quite happy for other groups to use it, but I do think that's quite a strength. I mean, it's purely because Catch has, 22 yeah. deal with that group, and so they came to us wanting a programme. That was where it's come. Uh, I understand the need. Yeah. Well, it could yeah, but, but, but I say the majority is just to engage young people really in planning, and there, there, there hasn't been that much that's done mm. uh, with young people at risk of offending. There might be other programmes, but not, not, not this sort of programme. Okay, please. Just a short uh, question about the workbook you you spoken about. Um, is it for download on one of the websites, um, or where, where can I? get that, such material. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure it is for download yet because part of the evaluation was to uh, to actually f finalise it. These have all been in our minds pilot projects because we've been running it and evaluating it and then the idea the idea is there will be a manual for uh, YDAC which will have everything including training because we do run training session with the police mentors and with the youth workers there's a whole lot of stuff that will go into a manual uh, but at the moment and I, you could have a look on the on the uh, I haven't got it up there, but Catch, Catch 22. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it might be on there, yeah. uh, but yes. I can't remember if it oh, is or not. Sorry. The, 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 from the youth department here from Munich. Yes. Uh, from the city administration, and we, we have, of course, the same problems um, with youth in urban spaces, with seating benches, yeah, yeah, yeah. all the places where uh, yes, the kids are hanging out, and the same. Yeah. And we okay. have already some programs, but that sounds really interesting. Okay. Well, if you'd like to give us your contact details, then yeah. we can we can contact you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to understand your institutional relationships and with the local authorities, so it was just mm -hmm. the link with the the issue the lady just raised. Is obviously you're designing um, or the implementation happens in a public space. And so the local authorities got to take ownership at the end of the day, so there's sustainability and maintenance. Is there an example of whether that's been done and how sustainable that is? In, in, sorry, example for, from this. So if you're implementing the project, local authority presumably has to take ownership of the design project. So if yeah. it's a a bench or the single seat, so they've got to, over time, maintain it, and yes. it's a cost factor. Okay. So what is that institutional arrangement relationship? Well, if they, uh, it, we, the reason we have planners and people who are from the local authority on the uh, judging panel is that that is part of, if they choose to take the idea on, then they would, I presume, look at those costs. So the one example that has been implemented, which is the underpass, uh, has well, there was already money for regeneration in that area. It was part of a regeneration area. Um, and uh, they had some plans, which they then got rid of and replaced them with the, um, with the young people's plans. I presume there must have been some costing thing gone on at the same time. But uh, that happened over a period of about six months after the WIDAC, and the young people were invited into the offices of the planners, engineers, to actually see how they were going to turn their ideas, which are obviously they're young people's ideas, into an engineering reality, if you like. But that is all borne by the local authority. Okay, please. I would like, uh, if uh, after the program has finished, uh, there are uh, measures, uh, implementation measures, 
but there are they uh, perhaps also other activities uh, in sense of uh, uh, intergenerational um, relationship building and community building mm -hmm. which aren't uh, 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 implemented from from uh, from um, in, in 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 a program itself, uh, but it's uh, it's more uh, self uh, uh, organizing, uh, more uh, empowerment for doing the things uh, uh, for themselves. Uh, are there so uh, so structures and activities after these programs? Um, I'm not aware of any of them. I, I think the situation that we've got is that um, we run Youth Design Against Crime and then obviously we had the chance to do an evaluation and then to go back and to look what happens afterwards and really from the evaluation what we know would be nice is that because we would like to run obviously this program again and we would like to run it in different European countries as well um, but what we really do need is that there's more done after the program finishes and you're right it doesn't have to be about the design uh, solution. It could be just about something like, say, getting young people involved in democratic processes. It could be them going to planning meetings. It it could be something different. And that building that in, that would make it a lot more sustainable, I think, and have a much wider impact. Could I just mention it might be useful to look at on the Catch-22 website the Community Space Challenge because this is a programme not that dissimilar, um, which involves an engagement over up to two years, um, which is also intergenerational. It brings young people from the neighbourhood together with older local residents who historically have been quite antagonistic towards each other, um, and it facilitates them working together, perhaps improving some wasteland or renovating a playground or doing something which together they agree needs to be done in the community which has multiple benefits in terms of improving the neighbourhood, giving young people a sense of uh, involvement and ownership, developing their skills and building links between generations. So it, it's not innovative in the sense of design, but it is, I think, address, addressing one of the questions that you were referring to. Sorry to interrupt, yeah. but it was no, no problem. Thank you for all the interventions, and to you, Caroline and Andrew, thank you for your presentation.